Women Taking the Lead, Episode 194. We influence, but we can be a negative influence or a positive influence. And I believe everyone deep down wants to be a positive influence, which is really what leaders do. And so the best way to be a positive influence is to treat yourself better and to understand yourself and make sure that relationship is a great one. Hello, my name is Jody Flynn and welcome to Women Taking the Lead, where we are all about creating blasts of inspiration to help you overcome self-doubt so you can lead with confidence, integrity, and a sense of humor. Head over to womentakingthelead.com to join the community and get the resources to support you on your leadership journey. Now, your future awaits, so let's get started. Your website tells a story about your business. At Zebra Love Web Solutions, Millie and her team are going to make sure your website tells the story you want your customers to hear. Connect with Millie at ZebraLoveWebSolutions.com to create the impression you want to make. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Women Taking the Lead. I'm excited to be bringing you the male perspective today. This podcast isn't just about women helping women. It's my philosophy that it's going to take both genders working together to see more women stepping up as leaders, and we can gain a lot of insights from men. So I interview men who work with women around their leadership development. And as our guest today, we have TJ Jones, who is a leadership crusader, author, speaker, team builder, and coach. He has spent 25 years first as a teacher and coach, then 20 years as corporate sales executive and head of training and development. TJ Crusades for fierce caring, caring to be our best selves, caring for others, and caring for the greater cultural good. TJ's mission is to awaken, influence, and inspire others to become caring warriors. TJ, thank you so much for coming on Women Taking the Lead. And tell us a little bit more about you so everyone has a good sense of who they're listening to right now. Thank you. It's so, such a pleasure to be here. I'm, I'm excited to have this conversation and, and bring value to your, to your listeners. As you said, my mission is to awaken, influence, and inspire. And those are those are big general words, but ultimately I want individuals to have the opportunity, and that's both men and women, to to be the best that they can be, to take that best self out into the world and influence the people around them. And then by doing so, inspire a better workplace a better culture, a better society. And, and I believe that starts with the self. And part of my story that, that I'm happy to share is the post-teaching days as a corporate person. I, t- In 20 years, I had 18 different bosses and was part of eight company acquisitions. And so that was tremendously stressful, lots of change. And in being a leader myself, I was privy to a number of conversations about personnel, about how to develop or not develop others. And they just kind of burned me out with the negativity and the fear-based leadership. And I was not present when I was home. I traveled a lot and I was losing myself in the process and had always been the caring, happy, person that wanted to reach out and to help other people. And I got grumpy, if if there's no better way to put it than that. And so I went through a tough time and I essentially had an awakening and I felt compelled to tell my story and to help others. And as you said, to be a crusader for more caring and in a fierce way, not stuffed animals and lollipops, but to really care enough to make things better. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know, and we were talking before we hit record, I've had my own experience with mergers and acquisitions and changing bosses. And I think the environment today, the corporate environment anyway, is so unstable. Well, let's be honest, the economic environment is so unstable these days that I think people are craving the kind of leaders that they can connect with. Like we don't need uh, surety so much as we need to know that we can rely on the leaders above us that, you know, they they have our interests at heart and are going to do what they can to help us to provide us resources and the know-how um, and that added moral support to help us to be the best that we can be and not go home so grumpy. <laughs> so true. You know, one of the things that 
I would say in the interviewing process and in the early onboarding stages with people that reported to me and in the training field, you're a lot of people are coming into your into contact with you. I realize that I'm a part of their story. Our lives are a story personally and professionally. And there's a responsibility, especially if you're in a, a position of influence, to be a positive part of someone's story. And so I think that leads to thinking that way, leads to a more positive intention, as you said, even in difficult times, even when you're delivering some some feedback, uh, setting expectations, holding someone uh, accountable for either behavior or performance that's not up to par. There's a way to do that with a positive intention to help to grow, to lead someone to more growth and development. And that's what I'm talking about when I say fierce caring, uh, sensitivity to someone else's needs someone else's motivations, what gets them up in the morning, for example, to go to work, but how you bring yourself to the table and and treat that has everything to do with how the story plays out. Awesome. And TJ, to start us off with, I, I'd love to hear you tell a story about a woman who has impacted you as a leader. You shared a little bit with me before, but um, I know the audience love, loves to you know, get this start off so that they really get a sense that you do understand and appreciate women as leaders. I certainly do. And we had a moment to speak before we started the, the program I've had the, the great fortune to report to a number of very impressive female leaders throughout my career. I mentioned that it, w it was a, a senior executive who gave me the, my first opportunity. And she was just such a nice combination of smarts and strategic thinking. And uh, she was a great presenter and gave great direction. But she had a warmth about her. She had uh, a vivacious personality and just a very, very likable person. And so she's she comes to mind as someone who balanced those those aspects very beautifully and was very influential. And, and I'm grateful for the opportunity. But since you asked this question, I have to tell you that ultimately it's my wife who has made me. Uh, the leader that I believe I am and given me the courage to, to do what I'm doing. Uh, I wouldn't be crusading for much right now if I didn't have her love and support. She's just an amazing woman. Uh, she's a wife, thankfully. Mm -hmm. uh, she's a, a fantastic mother. She's a fitness professional, which serves other people in such a positive way. And she just does all these things with such grace and positivity that in the book that I've written and in the work that I do, I think underneath it all, she's she's the hero of the story. Awesome. And on the flip side of things, TJ, what because you have had a lot of experience with female leaders and now on the flip side of things, you are definitely mentoring and helping and encouraging women to step up as leaders in, in their own lives and in their professional lives. So what would you say is something that you see in women that, that tends to hold them back as leaders? Well, if I may, I'd love to tell a quick story. I had a, a, one of the many bosses that I had, I told you I had quite a few changes, was such an impressive person, smart and educated, just very analytical, and there was so much to learn from her. During one of my performance reviews, she actually broke down, and it was very upset. And uh, to come to find out later that she had had her business review with her boss earlier in the day, and initially I was shocked and wondering why is this happening during my business review, but. You know, she felt like she could trust me and opened up. And she told me that the feedback she'd gotten, uh, not just in the scoring and the other things that come with her annual review, was that she was too harsh and had an intimidating style in the way that she treated people. And the irony in all this is that 
she shared with me that the pressure to, to work in this environment as a woman, and she, there certainly was around a number of her cross-functional colleagues were men, that there was a tremendous amount of pressure. And I believe that she overcompensated, and his feedback was, was true. And so I think something that can hold back, and, and I think as it ties back into that story, is a, a self-acceptance. And that realizing that those other qualities that really men and women bring to the table, but in her case, that other side of herself was completely shut down. She was overcompensating in the the toughness and trying to win respect and be, get approval as opposed to letting that happen by being her best self. And uh, you know, if I may, I'll just say also that there, as I look back on my career, most of the people who reported to me were women, and I learned, you know, so much, and never really thought about people in terms of their genders. Everyone's unique, and I think as a good coach, a good leader, you're supposed to approach them in the way that that best suits them and the in the situation. But I've found that that women are every bit as driven as men. They're typically better listeners, uh, better at multitasking. And juggling more things at once, uh, I, I think that men tend to be less, have less of a tendency to overthink things, which means sometimes of a decision may be made too fast and you have to to retract. But um, it's just very interesting in, in thinking about this uh, b- before getting on the call. And uh, but we are all different, and that makes for a richer experience. And I believe that this example, this woman, and all people can can influence more by being who they are as opposed to trying too hard to, you know, get approval and respect versus earning it through being your best person, your best self. Mm -hmm. And you and I keep referencing the conversation we had before we hit record. We probably should have just hit record (laughs) at that point. I know. know, I'm going to go back there again, too, because one of the things we had chatted about was how um, this, this new emerging form of leadership that's coming out balances masculine and feminine qualities. So some of the greatest leaders we're seeing right now are women who are able to embrace their masculine side and men who are able to embrace their feminine side. And so rather than what we were seeing in the past, where as women, you had to shut down those masculine tendencies of like, you know, taking massive action, being a decision maker, you know, moving forward, being really confident. Um, what Instead of shutting that down, now what we have to do is start allowing those qualities to come forth. And I think, you know, what you're alluding to, we see this sometimes is when we're trying to develop develop a characteristic that we have not thus far developed or that we're giving a try, sometimes we overcompensate and we go Mm. to the extreme, you know, because we're just so uncomfortable with it that we just like shoot it out there. And then (laughs) then we we've got a massive amount of, you know, women who are exuding masculine energy or or on the other side, men who are exuding a massive amount of, of feminine energy when, you know, the approach you're um, proposing is to just allow it to be, yes. allow it to come forward. Say more about that, TJ. Well, it's it always starts with the self and this awaken, influence, inspire uh, mission really comes down. The awaken is is the internal piece. And if we're working on that and uh, dealing with those negative mind monsters that we all have, that we question ourselves, we wonder if we're enough for the challenges, if we're appreciated and and validated in our everyday lives, you know, so it, it really begins there. And we have to pay attention to that. And I think being kinder to ourselves and for your audience um, allowing, as you said, to to be the full expression of who you are, which really isn't isn't like anyone else, men or women. It's it's who you're going to be. And I know that may sound light and uh, you know sort of esoteric, but it, it's really meant to be that that unique expression of the gifts that we all have, bringing together our talents, our competencies with 
our desire to to bring ourselves out into the world and influence people. I believe everyone has that in them, and that's kind of what I mean by that by that fighting spirit. And you know, the the idea of being kinder to yourself is you know, developing your self-esteem. I wanted to recommend a book to your listeners. It's called The Confidence Code by Caddy Kay and Claire Shipman. They also have a, a great assessment that can be done on their website. Um, and a great quote that comes to mind. I hope I get it right. But warmth is the conduit of influence. It facilitates trust in the communication and absorption of ideas. And so in addition to being competent and pushing back on things that maybe aren't right in your work life, your uh, entrepreneurial business, your your uh, position within an organization, feel strong in, in pushing back and, and standing up for those things that you believe in. But on the other side, be warm, be caring. And balance those things as best you can. And I think that you'll be a, a more fully realized expression of yourself as a leader, regardless of what, what field you work in. And I just love the idea of, of everyone bringing their best to the world. I think things would be better. Although that may sound idealistic, there's a little too much negativity out there. We need more positive and more caring leaders like the folks in, in your, your audience. Mm -hmm. We're going to get there one person at a time. I <laughs> promise you, TJ. And we chatted a little bit about, you know, the influence that women who, who you've looked up to as leaders have had on your life. What would you say you've learned from the women that you've mentored? Because you and I both know in the mentor protege relationship, there's always a give and take on both sides. The mentor gets, you know, just as much out of the relationship as a protege does. So what have you learned from the women you've mentored? So much. And I happen to have a number of women that worked as field based sales people. And so there was a independence and an autonomy uh, about about that work. And so the mentoring and the coaching was done at times face to face and also done via the other channels of communication, which now there seem to be a million apps and uh, ways to communicate. But I I found in, in mentoring women that it was so important to explain and to discuss expectations. And so it really, uh, I would, I would say that one of the tools that I came up with over time had great influence by the women that were, that were on my teams. And I call it a contract for success. And the four is a number four. And ultimately it, what that comes down to is instead of just opening up the laptop when you sit down with somebody or getting right to the business, uh, particularly when you're beginning a relationship with with uh, a new employee or someone that you're you're going to be working uh, as a working with as a peer, is to discuss the expectations that you have of one another. And I limit it to four things because I think you start getting too many items, then it, it gets difficult to to meet those needs and. I think that's such a crucial part of a professional relationship, really, and a personal relationship. But in the professional world, I understood over time, and particularly from the, the women that I worked with, that it was really important to get on the same page to understand what do you need from me to feel engaged and successful, and then what do I need from you, and to have a really productive conversation and open and honest conversation. And that sets the relationship, the working relationship off on such a good note. And so I, I credit the women that I've worked with on, on developing that tool. Mm, I love that. I'm going to use that more often right. in different relationships I have, because I think you're, <laughs> you're absolutely right. I mean, as a leader, especially when I'm working more with contractors now, you often find yourselves in conversations about a project and what you need. But often we're not so clear and so direct to say, what are the expectations that you have of me? And here are the expectations I have of you. It just makes everything so much easier. So you don't you're not waiting till something happens to say, oh, oh, yeah. 
yeah, by the way, don't do right. that. Don't do that. You know, it, it, it's so yeah. awkward after something's already happened. So much better to give it up front. I am getting a little bit better, but it, it's also knowing myself in these different types of relationships. I mean, as a business owner, you know, setting expectations for a contractor is so much different than what it was like in the corporate environment when the job mm. descriptions were written out and everyone knew what they were supposed to be doing. And not, I should take it back, not so much different, but different because everyone's style looks different. It's it's like changing cultures every time you hire a new contractor. Yeah. Whereas in the corporate environment, everyone knew what the culture was of the environment. So this is a fantastic tool, especially to use as business owners. And TJ, what changes do you see are necessary for more women to step up as leaders? The words that come to mind there are to not change so much as to become, to grow, to commit to, you know, and I'm an old English teacher, so I, I, I think of things in terms of story and use the probably cliche word journey, but to to progress throughout our lives. I I listened to one of Oprah's commencement speeches. I, I think it was at Harvard, but she admitted that after her show ended, which was phenomenal, phenomenally successful, and I think served so many people, and of course, a success, a world shaker. And yet she admitted in this very vulnerable way that she wondered if she mattered anymore. And I think one of her initial projects after that was not an immediate success. And so that need to feel as though you're significant, that you matter, that you're uh, part of the ebb and flow of the world and connected to it. I would say the change is is not so much change, but to be committed to becoming that with what, within whatever environment you're in. And so if we take that into whatever professional environment you're in, it's to expect that to have the intention of continuing to grow, continuing to develop and better yourself. And if you're not getting that from the either the, the, the boss or the, the situation to, to really ask yourself, is this the right thing and the right place to do, to do what I have to do while I'm here? I took a really deep dive out of the corporate world to write this book and to share my story but I think really, and, and most people wouldn't and probably shouldn't do that, but to commit within their current situation to grow and to develop themselves and to, to really take a good hard inventory. If that's not happening, you're either stagnating or you're, you're going in the reverse. And so a lifelong commitment to telling that story of your life and making uh, the, the necessary steps to continue and grow and to develop, that to me is is the change. And of course, we want those opportunities to exist in our organizations. And really, if, there, if you don't have them, I think you should stand up and ask, uh, do what you can as a leader to, to bring forth those opportunities, develop yourself, and, and ask yourself, am I in a circumstance, am I in a situation where I'm growing? I love that, TJ. You know, and you, you hit on a couple of, I mean, you hit on a lot of things there. I feel like I could give 20 minute response to, <laughs> to what you just I said. I went off a little bit, I'm sorry. No, I love it. Um, but two things I really wanted to underscore is, is you know, how, how you keep highlighting that, you know, in order to be your best self, and to know that you have a life that matters to you, you have to do the work. You have to discover yourself. There's no one size fits all. Like you said, like you left the corporate environment to write a book. That's not the answer for most people. That was the right answer for you. And so for other people to bring their best self forward, to do work that matters, they've got to do the work to discover what is right for them to bring forth into the world. Amen. I, I'm such a big fan of journaling. When I sort of woke up and started to grow and develop, as I as I just recommended, in a much more positive way, I went to bed earlier at night, got up earlier in the morning, and and really took a lot of the junk in the trunk, I call it, and just poured it out into unfiltered writing, on you know in a journal, and 
it eventually morphed into much more positive thinking and planning and how do I want to be in the world? How do I want to be in my relationships and how can I develop myself more? And so I just can't stress enough that that's a really positive way to not hold all these positive ideas, stressors, fears internally, but to get stuff, get stuff out on paper and, um, to awaken to the to the self that's in there. I mean, if we wake up every morning inside of our own head, and I, I we're not meant to be alone, in my view, but there is the inner life, that inner relationship, and it has to be a priority, or we're not truly living. And I said before, we influence, but we can be a negative influence or a positive influence, and I believe everyone deep down wants to be a positive influence, which is really what leaders do. And so the best way to be a positive influence is to treat yourself better and to understand yourself and make sure that relationship is a great one. I agree with everything you said. I'm not going to touch it. I'm just going to leave it right there. And I encourage everyone to revert, rewind about a minute and listen to that again. I love it. And TJ, speaking about putting words on paper, what's one thing you're working on right now that you're really excited about? Well, I launched my first book. I told you that I, I went off the high dive. Mm-hmm. And although I was an English teacher, I didn't I didn't really write myself. I graded a lot of papers. And so I wrote this book called The Caring Warrior. And it was just such a passion project. And it's it's been out for a couple weeks. It was actually uh, a hot new release in the business leadership environment. I think it's a little bit more of a self-help book, frankly, with leadership undertones. But that's the thing that's that's sort of dominating my mind right now is and my energy is promoting that and, and trying to spread the word. It, there is no real platform. I'm not an ex, you know, famous CEO or athlete. And so, you know, that's taking up a lot of time. But I've also formed a partnership business for, I guess you could say, con- consulting, where we do leadership and team building. Uh, we're called Trigon Leadership Consultants. And I'll leave you with uh, trying to figure out what that acronym stands for. Uh, so, and, and really underneath all that, I'm like most people trying to figure out how to do the work and have the lifestyle and, uh, the relationships that, that enrich my life. But, uh, I want to create a new generation of caring warriors. That's the metaphor that I use. I just believe we, we need more caring out there and more positivity. So that was not one thing. That's a number of things. But uh, I think they all unite as to to what I'm doing. And I appreciate you asking. Mm-hmm. And I love that we're catching you as you're transitioning too, mm-hmm. and coming on and sharing your expertise. I really want to reinforce to those who are listening, you know, that you can still, you know, be an expert while you transition. You still have a lot to say. And I love that, TJ, even even while you're still trying to figure out a lot of new things in this world of like promoting your book and offering programs and getting into the online world, you know, you're offering yourself up to do um, take opportunities like this to showcase what you know. So thank you for that. And share with us a success quote or mantra and why it has meaning for you. It's hard to pick. I have so many. I'm going to pose a question to your audience and continually to myself. This is by uh, really the foremost expert on self-esteem, a gentleman named Nathaniel Brandon, who who has passed away. He wrote a book called The Six Pillars of Self-Esteem. He asked the question, does anything take more courage? Is anything more challenging and sometimes frightening than to live by your own mind, judgment, and values. Is not self-esteem a summons to the hero within us? And why does that quote have meaning for you, TJ? I love the verbiage, the the word courage and hero. I I do believe we all have that in us, and so it, it lines up very nicely with the metaphor of the caring warrior. But for me personally, I lost myself. I thought that being a sensitive and caring man was 
shameful was my liability. And I, I woke up with the help of my wife and, you know, a number of other, another of ac- other actions. But I woke up to the fact that that's my strength, caring about other people, having a sensitivity uh, with the strength of uh, other energies within me is my strength. And so that's, that's what that means to me. And I believe we all have that. And I believe we all want to live out some version of a heroic and courageous life. Mm-hmm. And lastly, tell us how this community can connect with you. Well, I do have accounts in a number of these social media places, but I really think the best place to begin is my website. It's tjjonesleadership.com. And my new book is is available. I have a, a sample, a 15-page sample of the introduction, which I think will, will, will really tie people into it. And so I would offer up to your to your listeners that if they they go to my website and they they do what I call a positive influence assessment that will bring them into to my tribe of caring warriors and I will send them a sample of the book and uh, I think that would be a great way to connect with me. That's amazing. And for those of you listening, you know you can find all the links and resources TJ shared in this episode at womentakingthelead.com. And TJ, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with us today. We are all better for having met you. It was my pleasure. I loved it. Thank you for joining me on Women Taking the Lead. Are you ready to take the lead in your own life but need some support? Head over to womentakingthelead.com forward slash contact to introduce yourself. And to strengthen you on your leadership journey, I'd like to send you off with a quote from Marianne Williamson. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of God. Your playing small does not serve the world. There is nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We are all meant to shine as children do. We were born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. It's not just in some of us, it's in everyone. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. Again, thank you for joining with me, and here's to your success.